not been to Minnesota in probably 20 years. Bring your ass. Welcome to Flagrant Howls, a Minnesota Timberwolves lifestyle podcast. It's a State of the Wolves Monday here on Flagrant Howls. We got the sports dad, Judd Zolgad, over there. You're going to be at Target's. I didn't respond to your text. I have totally just remembered that right now. Yeah, you blew me off. That's I'm, okay. Yeah, it was it was Vikings post-game or pre-game. Uh, Judd will be at the arena for Wolves-Lakers. I will be back in the arena sometime soon. So that's me responding to your text. Oh, right thank there. you. Okay, so yeah. yeah, you can't. Oh, no, that's fine. That's I will, fine. Okay. I will not be there tonight. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we got Dex in the house here. Phil, before we get into our state of the wolves, and they did win a game, so they won a game, but I have a feeling we're going to be leading with a lot of our least favorite wolves things based on the last few days. But uh, one of our favorite things is Bricksworth, a couple blocks away from Target Center. Bricksworth in the North Loop is perfect for both home and away games. For away games, just a bajillion TVs, dry rub wings that you are going to salivate over, some of the best Detroit style pizza in the metro area, and the Nas Reed Hazy IPA. Imagine all these things in front of you while you're just watching on TV at Bricksworth or pregame, postgame, again, steps away from Target Center. Cheaper parking options as well, so stop by and eat, get a couple beverages, and then walk on over to the game. And they brew their own craft beer also in the OG Burnsville location. So Bricksworth in the North Loop, check them out. Let's get started with our State of the Wolves here. We're going to throw it to, to Declan to guide us through these potentially choppy waters today. Yeah, I'll be your Mark Madsen towel wave over here. First team all towel wave as we guide us through uh, the State of the Wolves. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so far, through 19 games, Wolves are 9-10. and 10. They are under 500. They are 9-10. and 10. They are 10th in the Western Conference. They're five and a half games back of first, and actually a game and a half back of just being in the plan. Through 20, almost 20 games. So they are now a game and a half back of, I believe it's the Spurs. So uh, a crowded Western Conference, like always. Wolves are 18th in offensive rating. They're ninth in defensive rating. According to ESPN.com, they have a 19% chance to make the playoffs. That has obviously been taking a tailspin. On basketball reference, it's 23.6. So basketball reference, a little slightly more bullish now on the Wolves making the playoffs compared to ESPN. And the Wolves have a 0.1% chance to win the Larry O'Brien Trophy, according to ESPN. Uh, basketball reference gives them no odds. It's not that it's 0.0, it's just, it's blank. There's there's no... Uh, <laughs> what, well, they forget? There's I, I don't no know universe. If it's, they, there's they, no universe. I think they just, they like, win. must cut it off after, like, all right, if you're below point one. We're just uh, Hey, Larry, right, update fair. those Wolves' odds, would you, when you get back from lunch? Like, no. No chance. Our data entry system just uh, ceased to exist <laughs> below point one. Uh, so Wolves vibes right now are blank. Judd, you want to start us off with uh, the vibe check? Hanging by a thread. They are hanging by a thread, by an ever so thin thread. Um, this was, I, I saw this very differently. Now, now, first of all, too, we're at that uh, that magical 20 game mark, which we had t talked about, which is fairly important because like this is by the time by the time you get to 20, you'd like to see it gelling. Instead, it's going the up the opposite way. But what's really, uh, um, I guess, impacted me is to realize how much friction exists here. Uh, it was one thing. We, it started when in Toronto, a bad, la a bad loss to the Raptors, when Julius Randle wouldn't share the ball with, with his friend Rudy. Uh, that was the first sign. Throw me the ball, Rudy. Or... Julius, throw me the ball. No, I won't. But then the when Ant felt it necessary after the Wednesday loss to the Kings to go nuclear, uh, and absolutely aired out everything. And I and I think he did it. I think he was really pissed off. But I also think that it was calculated because yeah. these are clearly things he's been saying and he's not being listened to. And and he included himself, I think, to try to be a good teammate, and he should. But they are hanging by a thread here. Like, like this is, if the correct term is critical mass, like this is a absolutely crucial point here because this can go one of two ways. And they did come back and beat the Clippers on Friday in an incredibly ugly game, but they got a win at least. But um, yeah, this is this is way worse than I assumed it would be because I didn't realize that there would be this much friction. I knew that there would be time where they probably didn't look in sync, but now we've got this whole 
other thing. And Gobert keeps giving these quotes about when when we decide to play like this, we're fine. But if we don't, like, like they're very they're very layered in what's wrong here. So it, so yeah, hanging by a thread, and we are at a very critical juncture because this team needs to make a decision about what it wants to do here. Yeah, I'll you I'll say Wolves vibes are selfish, and I'm gonna read you because this is the first time that we with the holiday weekend. This is the first time that we've really been able to react in long form here on Flagrant Howls to some of the things that Anthony Edwards was saying, you know, four days ago. And there, and there, it's not like he says those things four or five days ago and okay, yeah, uh, and we're going to fix it overnight. The, right. We're going to beat the Clippers and it's all clear, right? These are still lingering issues that are going to take time to iron out if, if they can iron these out. So I'm, I'm going to go through and you can stop me here, but from the athletic. More troubling to Anthony Edwards than the losses themselves last week was the bad body language he saw on the court. The good vibes of last season, the connectivity, the tenacity are all gone, and Anthony Edwards does not know what to do. Quote from Anthony Edwards. So actually, he is he is saying this to Rudy Gobert as he walked out with reporters in the locker room. It's like we're not even happy for each other out there. I've never seen nothing like this in my life, Anthony Edwards said. And then he said to the media directly, we're soft as hell as a team internally. Not to the other team, but internally, we are soft. We can't talk to each other. We're just a bunch of little kids. Just like playing with a bunch of little kids. Everybody, the whole team, we can't talk to each other. And we've got to figure it out because we can't go down this road. However many of of us it is, all 15, we go into our own shell and we're just growing away from each other. It's obvious. We can see it. I can see it. The team can see it. The coaches can see it. I'm trying to get better in that aspect, figure out what the hell to say to get everybody on the same agenda because everybody right now is on different agendas. I think that's one of the main culprits of why we're losing because everybody out here has their own agenda. And we're trying to figure out, you know, what does he mean by agenda? And and there's been some speculation about, well, look at the contract. I mean, Julius Randle is a pending free agent. Nas Reed is potentially a pending free agent. He has a player option. Uh, I think Nikhil Alexander Walker is up for a contract. So you've yep. you've got a lot less long term certainty with some of the guys on the team. And then obviously you swap out a franchise longtime staple in Cat, who I want. I would like to mention. Cat was not like the pillar leader of this thing. Well, Cat was more along for you. Can't just say well they took they took away Cat. Cat was like their no, I mean, Cat was a leader in some respects, but it wasn't like you're taking away Jokic from the Nuggets or something in terms of like, oh, this is his franchise in that regard. So it is interesting that this this leadership stuff and this toxicity definitely filled the void of Cat, and that's a problem. Yeah. But Anthony Edwards was a leader last year, even more so now, 23. Conley, Kyle Anderson that's feels the like the biggest leadership loss He's when you look at this up. thing. He's been brought up supposedly as the guy behind the scenes. So so I think what's most interesting about what Ant is saying, and we have no idea of the dynamic, is it's very clear. And I think Conley's talked about this too. Instead of being able to critique your teammates, it sounds like everyone gets very defensive. And so instead of saying, hey, you should have done this or that, whoever we're talking about, Julius Randle? Well, I mean, Dante he, he's been... Dante I don't yeah. know, but but it sounds like there is a like there is an umbrage taken to how dare you criticize my game. Look at your own game, which gets to be a very slippery slope. Again, I will say this. It is as if a, a genie came and took what was wrong with the wild locker room for years, transported it to the Wolves, and the Wolves culture went to the wild, and I don't know how the hell this took place. But there is clearly a friction about anything that's said, and Conley's talked about this as well, which probably carries more weight than Ant because he's seen a ton of stuff. Now, Conley also claims that things are going to to be fine, but he's also trying to calm things down. Mm -hmm. So I I just think that that is such an interesting dynamic that behind the scenes – and, and there's another discussion here, too, is, and we don't know it, but what's Chris Finch doing about this? Because he is certainly not, in my opinion, holding minutes accountable enough consistently. Um, Rob Dillingham on Tuesday night against the Rockets was fabulous. Plus 26, provided a massive spark, massive spark. 
Conley comes back. Okay, that's great. Mike Conley shouldn't pay the price, but he's a veteran. He's 37. He's going to miss time this season. This is not going to be last year. And Rob Dillingham disappears. Let's okay. Let's officially move into least favorite wolves thing, and and t- and talk about this because this, this you've hit on my number one least favorite wolves thing from the past week, which is the refusal to play Rob Dillingham after what happened in the second half against the Rockets, and even by the way, Terrence Shannon Jr. He played a couple games in the G League just to keep him warm, averaging thirty three points and a bu- I mean he's just he's better than the G League. Dude can't get a sniff. But let's let's just hone in on the Dillingham thing for a second. Sure. He comes in, dude, number eight overall pick. Right. He's not a project second rounder like a Josh Minot or a Leonard Miller. You moved up to draft this dude eighth overall to inject offense and sparks into your team and a backup point guard, right? And you wait like three and a half weeks to play him any meaningful minutes. And I'm not talking about six minutes here, nine minutes. I'm talking like 18, 20, 25 minutes. That, those are meaningful minutes. So they waited until the Houston game, basically. He leads a massive comeback in the second half. And there was a couple little mistakes. He's a freaking 19-year-old rookie. Yeah, he had a couple bad turnovers or whatever. But he was a plus what? A plus 24 or something in that game? It was crazy. 26. Plus 26 in like 24 minutes. So, wow, Rob Dillingham, fourth quarter. Okay, game goes to overtime. You just watched him as the lifeblood to this comeback. He can't get on the court in overtime. The next night, a back-to-back when older players might be, like, he's 19 years old. It's a back-to-back. He barely plays. Like, put him out there. He's got fresh legs, right? Plays five minutes against the Kings the next night. And then he was a did-not-play coach's decision against the Clippers on Friday. So he goes from leading a comeback against the Rockets to basically not playing in overtime of the same game, to playing five minutes against the Kings, to not playing at all against the Clippers. And it's not because you've got an 11-man rotation. There's no room for him. You're just running eight dudes out there into the ground trying to jam a square into a a round hole on your little play set, right? So the, the refusal to play Dillingham is wild to me through the first, whatever it's been, 20 games of the season. Yeah, well, and when you know, like like Chris Finch has a front row seat to everything. The dysfunction that we don't see, um, the things that we do see, which, by the way, on the floor has been a problem. Like this team, which played this unbelievable, ferocious defensive style, not, now has certain guys who are like, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not participating in this defensive uh, series. So, like, Chris Finch takes a lot of blame here, I think. Like, like he is, what are you doing? You need to hold, I mean, your hammer is minutes. Everyone knows that. Your hammer is minutes played. And late in, in the Clippers game, fourth quarter, the Wolves, you know, again, falling apart, mounting a comeback. Julius Randle's off the floor. I tweeted, I wouldn't put him back in. Don't put him back in. He goes back in right, right when he's supposed to. You know, it's like, what is the... If you're not going to have any pushback of, hey, if you're not going to do it our way, then you're not going to play. It's it's as if Finch's intent on showing is is it Conley that this isn't going to work, so he needs to. I, they're just they're Chris Finch is not a dumb basketball coach, and yeah. he deserves a ton of credit for what what he did last year. So I'm you know he's not lost his mind, but if he has a strategy here, I am hard pressed to see it. And you're right. Rob Dillingham, you traded up to the eighth pick to get him. He should be playing. You know, I, I'll use – this is kind of apples to oranges, but I'll use an example from a decade and a half ago. When a player goes to a new team, egos sort of refresh and reset because you're going into a different team's culture. So if the new team's culture decides to change your role a little bit or reduce your minutes – you're not going to be offended out of the gate as much because, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm coming into somebody else's home. And, yeah, I def, like I want to play, but like I'll fit into what they're doing. When the, when the Timberwolves traded Kevin Garnett to the Celtics back in 2007, and the, you know, the Celtics' Paul Pierce was there. They brought in Ray Allen, Doc Rivers, and KG's going into someone else's home as a really, really good MVP caliber player, right? A future Hall of Fame player, which Julius Randle is not, by the way. Sure. So KG, as one of the 50 greatest players of all time, goes into Boston, having played 
39 minutes a night for the Timberwolves the last few years. He was playing 40, 39, 39, 40, 39, 38, 38, 39 minutes a night for like a decade with the Timberwolves. He gets to Boston as a 30-year-old, and they say, hey, listen, you're not going to play 40 minutes a night. Not because you're not an incredible basketball player, but because we've got to, we're, we're going to keep you fresh. Uh, you're 30, 31 years old now, so let's just like let's let's scale back a little bit on the workload, and also let's we've got we've got a nice roster here, so they, it's apples to oranges. But to a Hall of Fame player, an MVP player in his prime, Boston said initially, "Hey, we're going to reduce your minutes first year out of the gate from 39 down to closer to 30 or 32." And it's not a thing because you're joining a new team. Oh yeah, whatever. Let's do it. The problem with the Wolves now is they're running Julius Randle out there for 35, 36 minutes every single night. And you look around now and it probably, I'm not saying he shouldn't play, but like you brought it up a few weeks ago, it might make sense to put Nas in as a starter at some point very soon. It might make sense to reduce Julius's minutes from like 34, 35 down to 28. But because you came out of the gate with him playing as a starter, super high usage minutes, now it's going to be a thing with a cantankerous player when you inevitably say, hey, man, yeah, we're going to make a switch here. And and it's like, is he going to be able to handle that personality-wise? And that's been an issue at different stops. So, like, they kind of missed their chance to ease him into a lesser role and see how it goes. And instead, they've just been like, Julius Randle, he's going to be literally the, we're just going to put him out there for 36 minutes a night and game flow be damned he's coming in when he's supposed to come in because there's they're like it feels like they're walking on eggshells around him quite frankly but and coming off that king's game i i think that as a coach you had carte blanche to do whatever at that point you wanted yeah and and ant melts down which again i i actually appreciate i mean somebody probably had to say something but the reality is they're just they hell the rockets game the dillingham thing go back to that what better thing to come back and say, you know what, this kid, this kid doesn't understand what's wrong here, and because of that, he's playing free, and so he's going to play. Uh, but it's like the accountability is gone. They're they're walking on eggshells. Divincenzo's being used incorrectly. Like there's just a lot of things from a schematic coaching standpoint that I don't get, and I'm no basketball expert, but it does seem odd that you're altering almost nothing. And and this is now a crisis. Like like you are, you can't have a team that is, first of all, has lost its personality completely, which was a defensive tenacity. But second of all, that is that is basically fracturing. Like this, this is, I think, an easy call right now. This is a crisis. They've got to pick their path, and their path, like like if this continues, it's going to be too late. I am, by the way, like you're calling it a crisis. I am not there yet. I have told myself time and again that several of the Wolves' best regular season teams have started very slowly, 500 or much worse in the first couple months of the season. And I'm going to wait until sometime in January to officially. But there's some, yeah, some major red flags coming out with the things that Anthony Edwards right. is saying. That's my but, issue. But, dude, they were punching each other on the bench two years ago, and and the same group of guys turned it around. So, like, but but back to Chris Finch for a second. Your job as a head coach, there's a few different categories. Chemistry and team building, you're dealing with egos and highly paid players and personalities, and your main job is to get those guys to gel together and enjoy being around each other as coworkers. Well, that's been a fail so far this season. Hard task. Hey, here's two new players right before the season starts. Sure. Uh, the other thing is, okay, lineup combinations and X's and O's and schematics, right? Just like how do the chess pieces fit and maneuver on the court? Well, I mean, he's literally tried nothing new. Like he's continued to run the same eight guys out there, and it's been he's he's been very very stubborn with the way that he's going about this. And then I think, like, generally your third job as an NBA head coach is to find solutions to things. Like, you are you are there to find solutions and and make the player unlock players when things are going poorly. And to this point, he has not done that either. So it's been, yeah, man. And, and like, the fact that three or four times this year Finch has come out after games in the press conference, like five minutes after the final buzzer, and he said, yeah, if I could go back, I would have done this differently. Well, dude, that happened ten minutes ago. 
So like, why, <laughs> why weren't right. you thinking about it 10 minutes and ago? And why don't you do it? Like he said, <laughs> after the Rockets lost, he came out and said, yeah, I got to play Rob more. I should play Rob more. I'll play. Bro, the game ended three minutes ago. Well, like you weren't thinking about but that then the next when it was game, happening. But then the next game he barely right. plays and the following game he's DNPCD. <laughs> yeah. So anyways. Yeah, they're just the, the whole vibes are clunky and your offensive rating is falling. Like even though the Timberwolves got off to a slow start, like their offensive rating was still mostly been flirting with top 10 up until like last week. And now it's fallen to 18th and it just seems like Rob Dillingham is this perfect little spark plug off the bench that you can insert. And yeah, does he have woes that are defensive that make him a liability a little bit, but dude, you got to get your offense going. You need guys to start hitting their shots. Dante DiVincenzo is still struggling here. Julius Randall isn't where he is at. Uh, Jaden McDaniels, as we talked about last week is yeah. not hitting his shots. You need some type of offensive new life. I think Dillingham provides that. And I know, you know, when you're 9 and 10 and you had basically championship aspirations coming off one of the best seasons in franchise history, you're maybe going to start grasping at straws. And I don't think Rob Dillingham is the sole reason that the Timberwolves yeah. can turn things around. But when you're 9 and 10, you got to try something new. And I think not giving it to Dillingham to me is just very confusing. And there's just a bunch of shrug emojis from Chris Finch, which I hate. I, I hate the vibes with Chris Finch right now. I will say this, and fans are going to hate this, but I'm, I will say this. They made the Carl Anthony Towns trade in part because they're looking at a longer arc of like three to five years. Now, I I still like I know my take the day after the trade was from a basketball perspective, they actually got better because of what DiVincenzo can bring. And he hasn't yet. And and we'll see to what extent Julius Randle is a fit in a long term piece. But he's also a tradable asset for you even this year. Like they could still move him for something or a different player that fits better. So there's like there's chess chess moves to be made, but what they decided was this Carl Anthony Towns contract is never going to be more tradable than it is now. It's on the way to sixty million dollars, and he is going to turn thirty years old. He's been injured. He comes up short in the playoffs time and time again. So the, I think their main thing was we ha if we can offload this contract right now and give ourselves flexibility and get out of the second apron and get a couple players back, mm -hmm. let's do it. They were hoping that immediately these dudes would click and this thing would continue forward. It hasn't. Um, but I think they looked at it less as a, let's make a move right now desperately for 2024-25. It was a three- to five-year arc move. and Because yeah. if you're still sitting on that contract in a year or two as he regresses and gets more banged up and it gets more expensive, you're, there's no way you're going to get a DiVincenzo and a first-round pick and a Julius Randle caliber player. So right or wrong, I think... They're looking beyond 2024-25 with this move. Right now, they wouldn't even be in the play-in, as Declan said 20 minutes ago, if it started today. If I may, on a Monday, use this as a safe space that, that the show provides to recklessly speculate, I do have a question. That's sure, I'll give you cover here. Give Thanks. us some cover. Reckless speculation. I wonder now, with what we're seeing, because, again, I'll go back to my statement, Chris Finch is not a dumb coach. Chris Finch has done some great, really, really good stuff. I wonder if he didn't want the cat trade done, at least when it was done. Because, like, coaches coach year to year. They they don't think about, like, it's Tim Conley's job to think about 2026. Yeah. It's not Chris Finch's. Um, it just feels to me like Chris Finch, who I think is probably a, 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 a stubborn guy, Chris Finch is trying to prove a point. Um, and, and, you know, it did feel a little bit o over the top, the immediate, I love Julius and Julius, I love Finchie. Um, it's like, okay, you guys were together and he was an assistant with the Pelicans. Like, I'm not saying you don't like each other, but that felt a little bit forced. I wonder if he's trying to make a point here, which could result in the trade of Julius Randall sooner rather than later. And if that is accurate, again, recklessly speculating, this is not directly linked, but it could be in the acrimony that might exist. I wonder if Dillingham is being held a little bit hostage by Finch's attitude of, you sort of screwed me on this trade, buddy boy. I'm, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's, I'm just saying it, it, feel, it all feels very odd. It feels like there's an agenda from Finch here because I refuse to believe that he's just like, ah, it's going to be fine. Like, you are no longer playing. Your identity's gone. 
Like, like your identity was that defensive shutdown lockdown style. And I, all, I and I'm also with you. I refuse to believe that this is all a, oh my God, Cat was the captain of this team. So I'm with you on that. I I feel like this is more of a you upset the chemistry, the culture, and how we played. And I also wonder how much he and Randall actually coexist as like this this seemingly Pelicans buddies. Stories. Well, if they if they do, then it should be a lot easier for the coach right. to say, "Listen, this is what we need more of defensively, offensively." Exactly. So, uh, you know what they should do, Chris Finch and Tim Connolly. If you're right, if there's a little bit of a butting of heads, which I don't know, that is reckless. I'm glad they I got should safe go to cover. They should go to parlor and enjoy a parlor burger together, maybe, huh? Well, that's a fantastic idea because you know what? Right in the North Loop, right down the street. In fact, you could also stop in to parlor before a Wolves game. North Loop, and yes, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. We've all had it. It's unbelievable. The parlor burger is outstanding. But I also want to give you a little bit of a scouting report about the Rob Dillingham type of sandwich that exists at parlor. Because you know what? It's it's a little bit under the radar, but it shouldn't be. And that is the fried chicken uh, sandwich. Mm. Absolutely delicious as well. The burger, you can't go wrong. Uh, a craft cocktail menu as well kitchen open until midnight on fridays and saturdays so check it out parlor bar in the north loop a great place to bond whether that be uh chris finch tim conley and julius randall or you and your family and before we get to our favorite wolves things right now they did win their last game so like all right they're they're on the the right track a little bit but ks drywall providing full drywall plaster repair interior painting services they can't fix a fractured roster or broken egos, but they can fix your popcorn ceiling texture. Maybe you're looking to sell your uh, your older model house and you want to update it. Well, they can come in, get rid of that popcorn ceiling texture and uh, fix up anything else that needs to be fixed. Anything from a new construction to a small emergency repair, KS Drywall is here for you. No job is too big or too small. Quality craftsmanship, quality communication throughout the entire process. Head over to ksdrywall.com to schedule a free estimate. That's ksdrywall.com, Dex. All right, so my favorite Timberwolves thing right now, I am gonna. I don't know if I used it last week, but I've definitely been talking about how much I love watching him play, and we talked about the Wolves needing energy and just players to be effective and start making their shots, and Akeel Alexander-Walker has been able to give them exactly that. He's having a great start to the season. Um you know, we kind of forget about him as as a throw in a trade from from the D'Angelo Russell situation, but he has been phenomenal for the Wolves. He's hitting a ton of shots, fifty one percent on and off the court. He has the best uh, plus minus per one hundred possessions for the Wolves this year. He's just given them so much energy and spark, and that's where, and not to like continue to reopen the Rob Dillingham thing, like. All right, this guy has been able to give you energy and hits shots for you when you have other guys that are just not having their shots falling. And Nas been able to do that. He's clearly in the Chris Finch trust tree too, which helps his case. But Nas has been giving them effective minutes. I love what I'm seeing from him. Um, he has been one of the lone bright spots in this sluggish start uh, through the first 20 games or so. Yeah. Uh, I'll jump. I'll give you my favorite Wolves thing here, and then Judd can go. I think my favorite Wolves thing is that there's obvious solutions and levers to pull. Sometimes it's felt like in the past, like the Wolves are struggling or they're underperforming, and it's like, there's no real tweak that can fix it, but there are some glaringly obvious things that you could do. And credit to the sports dad for throwing this out like three weeks ago, but I'll give you something statistically here that should catch everyone's eye. So Rudy Gobert and Nas Reed, when they're paired together on the court, the Wolves are a plus seven points per 100 possessions. So it's very much a net positive when those guys are playing on the court, just like it was last year. Six points better than when Gobert and Julius Randle. Go, Gobert and Julius Randle on the court together, it's slightly better than like a break even. You're just trying not to lose ground, basically. So Gobert and Nas Reed, much better as a pairing, which, which I mean, they've been playing together for three years. So they, it's Rudy's a complicated guy to play with. Yes. Not unexpected that those guys would have more chemistry and play off each other a lot better. Yep. Um. And yet, Gobert and Randall have played twice as many minutes together than Gobert and Nas Reed. And, and there's like two or three other things just like this. I mean, Jade McDaniels has 
regressed in almost every conceivable area over the last couple years. You could reduce his minutes from 30 a night down to 22 or 24. But specifically, if Gobert and Nas Reed are that much better on the court together than Gobert and Julius Randle, I would be looking for ways to put them on the court together more often than Gobert and Julius Randle. It shouldn't be that the worst pairing is playing twice as many minutes together unless you think they're going to work through it and emerge as this power big man tandem, which, which by the way, Cat and Gobert did in year two, but there might not be a year two for Julius right. Randle here, which is part of the, the overall problem. So my favorite thing is that there are still levers to pull 100%. There are things you could do and tinker with. You just have to do it. So, Judd. I love the fact that Ant... Melted down. I, I think that that is, it brought to light something that needed to be public because clearly trying to keep it private and talk through it was not working. And, and then Conley piled on in a positive way, but by, by saying, you know, we're simply trying to help guys and they're getting defensive about the, these things and all of this coming to light, the sooner, the better. I actually think, and my guess is now, I, I was not there on Wednesday, but my guess is as Phil knows it ordinarily for a lot of guys takes some time. Like they'll shower first. Like it's not like ant is, is available immediately after games when, when he's at his most emotional, like he probably showered first, took his time because his immediate response was, do you, do you guys want to know why we all suck to which I, which I guess Chris Hine said, so why do you suck? Which, uh, which drew a big chuckle, but <laughs> It was clearly something Ant thought about. Like, he didn't just go off. He went off with a purpose. I yeah. like that. I'm not saying it's going to work, but keeping this private was clearly not the path to take. So I, I actually think in some weird ways, this young guy who's definitely the key to this team used a platform that he probably didn't want to have to use. Might have talked to Conley about it be, because, you know, because if Conley goes off like that first of all it's completely out out of character second of all he's 37 like this is ant's team yeah. so i like that i think if this team has any chance of getting back on the road that it should be on what happened after the loss to the kings was absolutely necessary and there were moments in the game on friday against the clippers although far from perfect where you did see an uptick in things julius started to play some more defense like, that clearly had an impact. So kudos to Ant. It's a lever you don't want to have to pull, but I think it was time to pull it. And clearly Chris Finch was not going to, so Ant yeah. did. Let me give you guys a stat of the week for the road here because it kind of ties in everything we've been complaining about and different levers that you could pull. I'm going to give you two different trends that are really interesting. The Timberwolves this season are 6.3 points better per 100 possessions when Julius Randle is on the bench versus when he's on the court. And that's why sports dad said to leave him on the bench. But this is even worse. Oh, no. The Wolves are 15 points better per 100 possessions when Jaden McDaniels is on the bench versus when he's on the court. This is a Declan problem because Declan sold me on Jaden. I was so sold, and now I'm not so sold anymore. Well, I mean, he's been, at times, he's been one of their most important players. Yeah. Oh, I know. But what's what's happened? He's just, he's, yeah. Well, first of all, he can't make a shot. I know. <laughs> so de yes. defensively, some of it's, you know, they're just not as connected defensively as a team. And maybe he's taking a brunt in that regard. He might also just be not as good defensively in some ways as he was a year ago. Because defense can, can ebb and flow, too, based on different factors. Sure. But the fact that he can't make a three anymore. I mean, he is a he's a bad three-point shooter. He's not even close to league average, and he shoots like 45% of his shot attempts are three-pointers. So you think about his offensive construct, his shot chart and his shot makeup is one of a guy that's a really good three-point shooter, but he can't make a three. So he, he either needs to start making threes because they're putting him in the corner, like they're setting up their offense for him to like – get the, the ball swung around for a wide open three and he's clanking them. So he either needs to figure out how to make a three ASAP or he and the Wolves need to remake his entire shot profile of like what, what they're setting him up to do. 
because it's just like when he's sitting out there taking four threes, five threes, whatever, and he's clanking, clanking. He was one for eight a couple games ago. Yep. So the fact that they are 15 points better per 100 possessions when that dude is on the bench versus on the court is super damning. Yeah, that's ugly. I mean, last year, I, I just... I thought when we were trying to figure out, hey, is there more to Jaden McDaniels? And it's like, well, he's been in the league now, same amount of time as Ant. I don't know. I, I, I that, that was kind of my thing of like, he can be effective, but like, is there another level to his game? And I just thought, I don't think there is offensively. Doesn't mean he cannot be a contributor. But right now, I mean, this is obviously the worst, worst he's looked. And again, it's just, it's just like, and I think this starts with the coach and goes on down. It's just like, there's a bunch of shrug emoji dudes right now. Of, well, mm-hmm. I don't know, from Ant to Jaden McDaniels, to everyone on this team's like, oh, I don't know. We're 9 and 10. I guess we'll figure it out. Like, dudes, like you're you're supposed to be one of the best teams going into the going into this season have championship aspirations and we're just like, ah, I don't know. I guess we'll figure this out. Like, no, mm-hmm. no, no. Figure this out now. There's yeah. there's urgency. But but the problem is I I don't think it's a shrug. I think it's anger. Like like I like that that's that's my my crisis statement is this team is fractured. Like how do you get this team and and I do think Jaden and this is, does not excuse the shooting completely, but I think Jaden's play is based largely on how the team feels. He is an emotional guy. Like, he is super. And I think when every well, when a lot of other guys don't care about defense, I think that impacts him. Like, I, I think the fact that this team played as a team, because they did. The 2023-24 Wolves were a team. Like, you don't play that style of clamps defense without being connected this team has no connectivity at all and so i i don't know that that fixes Jaden's shooting it probably does not but it does fix parts of his game that you absolutely have to have that aren't there and i do think ant cares i don't think ant now now ants at fault too shooting wise at times very hot and cold but i do think he cares i don't think he's shrugging Uh, But I also think that this team is at a point now, and I don't know if it's a Randall thing. Like, I just don't know. I don't know if it's a Gobert thing, because Gobert, to Phil's point, is difficult to play with. And the problem with Gobert is he doesn't seem to have the self-awareness. So it's like he gets offended. It's like, dude, it's very clear. You are difficult to play with at times. (laughs) But he's like, well, if we're not going to do this. And and so he pouts. I mean, that three-second stunt... How that did not earn him a place on the bench for the remainder of that game to me is coaching malpractice. Well, yeah, but I mean, okay, you want, but you want to go through the the trend. The Wolves are like eight or nine points better per 100 possessions when Rudy's on the court. Sure, you take not... you you take Rudy off the court, you're getting worse every single time. Like he was their most valuable player in the playoffs because of his and, presence. And I'm not going to bench him for an, a period of time. I but the rest of that game, that to me, and by the way, you lost anyway. That game to me, you've got as as a coach, you've got to take control here. What Randall did was selfish and I thought stupid, but what Gobert did was insubordinate to to the sport of basketball. Like you purposely proved a point by costing when the game is tied and nothing happened. And then he went down and continued his his selfish childish meltdown by fouling. I love how the state of the wolves has now spilled back over like two weeks ago that to that Toronto well, but, game. But it all, but but you want to talk about connectivity? It, that's all connected. That Toronto yeah. game played out through the through the Kings game. That is inexcusable. Yeah, it was. I mean, that the Toronto game was just that's that's the most we've ever been able to peek behind the curtain with this team. Where I understand it from from both angles. I understand if I'm Julius and I'm looking over at Rudy. Like we do, we we just called we called something here. It's it's an isolation for me or whatever they were going to get into, and, and you then, are like, de- yeah. you're derailing something. You're being selfish by trying to derail something with your ping pong paddle hands, bro. There's half a chance if I throw this ball to you, it's going to be a turnover the other way. Correct. Which I get. I totally get that. Rudy is Rudy is one of the worst uh, pass catchers unless you put it up above and it's and it's a lob. Like then he's money. So I get that from Julius. But then again, if you're Rudy, it's like, bro, I have a six-inch height advantage on a guy I'm sealing off under the basket. Throw the ball to me. Let's get a dunk and an and one here. And and also, like, even if Rudy's not that great at catching the pass, feed your teammate. Give your Throw your teammate a bone. Celebrate right. your teammate in that way. Yeah, okay, boom, he saw something. And for those guys both to be like, 
the opposite sides of a battery in that moment. It was, and then Ant has to pick who he's going to yell at, and he's going to yell at Rudy because Rudy got the three second violation. Like that was, that was the curtain being ripped wide open. Yeah. And the question, just to wrap this episode going forward, is: Do they have the leaders in that locker room? Starting with a 23 year old franchise player, not fully mature yet, right? Like him, Mike Con- Mike Conley to to some extent too in his older age. Mm-hmm. Do they have the pieces in that locker room to have uncomfortable conversations and Chris Finch too, and get this thing on track, or do they need to continue to remake the people that are in that room over the next couple months or the next six to eight months? if this is a multi-year project. So very festive State of the Wolves Monday here. Crisis. On Flagrant Howls. Judd's calling it a, a Team crisis. crisis. Team of crisis. Um, I will say, all right, positive fill here. They are, uh, they're only a game and a half back of the Nuggets right now, who are 10 and 8. They are a game up on the Kings, who were supposed to be a playoff team. There's there's other teams around that are trying to feel their way through this thing that didn't make massive trades right before the season happened. So I'm still I am still giving them the time that I allotted before the season. Give them a couple months. Let's see what this thing looks like in January, and then then maybe I'll join you and call it a crisis. Christmas Day crisis. It's headed toward a crisis. It's Christmas not a Day crisis. crisis in Dallas. <laughs> Yeah, Dallas kind of picked it up. They started pretty slow, and now they're up to they've won like four or five straight. They're up to like yeah the five seed in the Western Conference. So anyways, uh, Flagrant House listeners, appreciate you guys. Uh, If you could give us a five-star rating and a positive review on Apple and Spotify, you can help us keep growing this community of Wolves fans. And then on the Scorn Earth YouTube channel, click that like button and the subscribe button. This is a Timberwolves therapy and lifestyle podcast.